And now, I'd like to introduce my great friend, America's filmmaker, whom we are overjoyed to have with us in the midst of a whirlwind press tour. That tour included a stop at Fenway Park this week and visits I think we're at Harvard, are we? <laughs> and visits to the Today Show and the Colbert Report next week. A, <laughs> a very busy man, Ken Burns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I want to echo a little bit of what John and Dalton said and to just say how grateful I am to be involved in public television. Uh, this is a really special night for me. Uh, exactly 20 years ago this evening, um, the 23rd of September, uh, PBS first began broadcasting uh, our film on the history of the American Civil War. Uh, which became a kind of verification of the style that we had cultivated in a few films of moving through photographs and using not just third-person narrators but first-person voices and more importantly trying to excavate not the dry dates and facts and events of the past but a kind of emotional archaeology that would remind us uh, how valuable the past is as a teacher that it is in fact our greatest teacher and so it's thrilling to still be working in public television it's thrilling to still be working with WETA uh, as I have for 28 years, uh, and thrilling to be here with you to share uh, another film. Uh, now, John told most of what we're here for, and you already knew coming in, so I don't want to spend too much time other than to uh, reiterate that uh, we had no intention of following up the Civil War or baseball with any kind of addition or sequel, that, that we were urged so often to kind of turn these into cottage industries, and we thought that there were other fish we had to fry. But I love this game, and I've loved it all of my life. Um, the first game I went to was in the summer of 1959 when I was six years old, and it was to Memorial Stadium in Baltimore to see the Orioles play. That was my, f my first team, and I later moved to the Midwest and became a Tigers fan, but I've lived... This is great. <laughs> Anybody here from San Francisco? <laughs> um, and then I, I, I've spent the last nearly 40 years in New England, and it was really hard to arrive in New England about the time that Carlton Fisk and Fred Lynn and Jim Rice did and not become a uh, Red Sox fan, uh, which I have been for a long time. However, I must tell you that I have been working with Lynn Novick for 21 years, and she is a diehard Yankee fan. And, um, <laughs> and people say it isn't our national pastime. It's really <laughs> that, that football supplanted it. How, how, how crazy about it. Um, and uh, we have never had a fight in the editing room, and I am as uh, proud of the scenes and the Yankees and all the other teams as she is of the Red Sox scenes, and uh, it's just been uh, a really important partnership. And we produced this film with the idea that this was more than the story of games won and lost or careers rising and falling, but a startlingly revealing mirror of our country. Uh, baseball has accompanied nearly every era of our national existence, and so it seems to have uh, writ in its action uh, a way to understand the country that we've been that goes way beyond the political military narrative that usually passes for American history. In fact, we saw the baseball series as the sequel to our Civil War series, and when we told people that, they laughed. But if you remember, the, first, the reason why the Civil War was fought was over slavery. And the first real progress in civil rights after emancipation and after the collapse of Reconstruction in the aftermath of the Civil War 
did not occur at a lunch counter in Virginia. It did not occur in the barracks of our military. It did not occur at a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. It did not happen through the actions of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It happened on the diamonds of our so-called national pastime when Jack Roosevelt Robinson, a grandson of a slave, made his way to first base at Ebbets Field and changed not only the game of baseball but American social history forever. And so So we felt that we could learn about race, we could learn about immigration and assimilation as each new wave of immigrant group sought the permanent status of citizenship conveyed not by a piece of paper from the State Department, uh, but by participation in the national pastime of their adopted land, and it continues to this day. This is about the tensions between labor and management that was there at the very beginning of this game and exist to this day. Uh, this is the story of so many aspects of our uh, national life, the growth and decay and now rebirth of great American cities, often anchored by a brand new old style ballpark built uh, to revitalize the fortunes not only of the teams but of the inner cities they are now increasingly being built in. Uh, this is a wonderful story, uh, baseball, and it is the greatest game that's ever been invented without a, a, a doubt. And, um, you know, we, get, we have lots of fights in bars, as you can imagine, about it. But uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And we had figured that we wouldn't come back to it. But as John said, when we came out, there was a player strike in the middle of our broadcast. And we were the only baseball in town. And then as we watched the events of the last uh, 16 years unfold, um, we realize that these are among the most consequential, not only in our national game, but in our uh, country as a, as a whole, and felt compelled to come back and revisit it. Now, we were planning to show some clips tonight, and um, you have to understand that filmmakers absolutely hate to show clips. It takes a great deal of explaining when you could just watch the thing. And so you have been elected to participate in a really unique study. Uh, what we're going to do is lock the doors and show first the original 18 and a half hour series. <laughs> and then, um, and then we are going to show the new four hours. And um, if we don't eat uh, and we don't take bathroom breaks, we should be done by about six o'clock tomorrow night. And, um, but I think you'll get a sense of what I was talking about, of the, all the themes of immigration and race and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, I really look forward to it. Get comfortable, you know. Uh, untie your shoes. Um, no, we're just going to show a handful of clips. And uh, it's to introduce those clips and talk a little bit more seriously about our national past time. Uh, perhaps uh, is the uh, co-author of this uh, update, the co-director, co-producer, and co-writer of the film, uh, and my dear friend and co-worker and Yankee fan, um, Lynn Novick. Okay. Oh, shucks. Thank you. I don't think I've ever watched the entire 22 hours all in a row. That would be fascinating. We'll see if we repeated ourselves. Um, I, I don't want to speak too much about the clips because we sort of like them to stand on their own. Uh, what I just wanted to say briefly was that I'm thinking back to the fact that 20 years ago I had really just been working with Ken for about a year and while the Civil War was getting ready to broadcast we were already starting work on baseball and I believe that fall soon after the broadcast I went to Kansas City to find Negro League players to talk to and have the incredible privilege of knocking on the door of this one house in Kansas City and having Buck O'Neill open it. And uh, I just, I will never forget meeting him for the first time, being welcomed into his home and having him sit down and tell us all the things he was so willing to share about baseball and life and what really matters. And it truly was a life-altering experience for me, for which I will be eternally grateful 
to baseball and to Ken and to Florentine Films and PBS for giving me the opportunity to get to know Buck. And he came to be a great friend of ours, an inspiration to us, not just in making that film, but really in our lives. And we actually have dedicated this film to him, and we're very sad that he uh, is not alive to have helped us figure out what to make of the last 20 years of baseball history. Um, what we are going to show tonight is just a short assortment. The first thing you're going to see is the introduction, so that hopefully will not need me to explain anything about it. And then we're going to jump ahead in the first episode to a scene that follows a rather extensive discussion of the 1994 strike that both Ken and John talked about. And I think it is important for us to just, in, in seeing this clip that you're going to see, to kind of be reminded of how angry so many people were at baseball with this strike. It went on for months. Both the owners and the players seemed to the public to be unresponsive to the needs of the public at all and didn't seem to care about the fans. And it seemed to be about greed and sort of lack of accountability to the people who actually buy the tickets. And there was such resentment. People were vowing not to go to games. Attendance was down. People were literally coming, if they did buy a ticket, to yell at the players, to throw money at their feet, to hold up signs saying that they felt betrayed by baseball. So it was really, truly one of the low points uh, in the history of the game, I would say, since the Black Sox scandal of 1919. So that, that sets up the, the second clip you're going to see. Then the third clip is a scene from later on in the episode that deals with one of the central themes that we were interested in exploring uh, in the 10th inning, and that is the role of globalization in baseball. The, last, uh, the second to last clip is from the second show, and it follows uh, another theme that we will have been following, which is the question of performance enhancing drugs in the game. And we have sort of been tracing it rather subtly in the first episode, talking about how players have always looked for an edge and that there's been an element of cheating, sometimes at spitballs or corked bats, and how it had evolved into players actually taking medications uh, illegally to enhance their performance but it was something that really wasn't out in the open. And then in the 1998 home run chase, uh, you had a situation where these great sluggers were throwing the ball, hitting the ball out of the park, and it was this wonderful spectacle that the country reveled in. And at the very end of that, a bottle of Andro, which was an over-the-counter steroid, was uh, seen in, in Mark McGuire's locker. And that was sort of really the first hint publicly that this wasn't just a question of weight training and small ballparks, but there was something else going on with this uh, offensive surge that so many fans had been loving. And then uh, the final clip we're going to show just is about the deep love that so many people have for the game and what it means in their lives. So we really look forward to talking with you after the clips. Uh, enjoy the show. Thank you. It's your movie. <laughs> I said, you should bow. Certainly yeah, bow. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could somebody bring up the house just a little bit so we can see uh, folks? That would be really Ask nice. Uh, as we're doing that, uh, I... Um, wanted to say that one of the greatest uh, pleasures of working on any film is finding out, we, we never make films about subjects we know about. We need to find the smartest people, the best people, the most articulate people to help us understand the Shelby Foots, the Buck O'Neills, and in this film, it, most definitely the Howard Bryants, who, who is such a great writer and such a thoughtful speaker, and not only gave us this amazing footage, but also, uh, commentary, but also uh, helped us in the editing room get the story straight. So we're very pleased to share this stage this evening with Howard Bryant, and will you recognize him? <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to let you guys know, those of you who were excited by the last scene, um, <laughs> that you'll notice that one of the, the chalk on the blackboard, even for Yankee fans, is John Sterling. 
the announcer. And when he says, it's the greatest comeback in baseball history, you hear at different screenings, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, after a little sorbet course uh, it, that follows this scene that you just saw of, uh, of Wrigley Field and the Cubs, we go back. Anybody from Kansas City? <laughs> We'll get, we'll get through the whole ballpark by the end of it. Um, I, I, we want to start off, we're mostly anxious to hear your questions, but I wanted to start off a little bit. Um, I am at the end of a three-month, just absolutely exhausted uh, campaign to promote this film around the country. And it, as it often happens, by the time it's on, you're excited for the broadcast and you watch it. Uh, but you're very excited about the other films that are working on, and we, we've got a lot of films that we're working on. Uh, but I love this game so much, and I realized this evening, one of the last times we're going to be in front of an audience talking about the film and sharing clips, uh, how much I'm going to miss talking about it and thinking about it and going to games and all the stuff that I'll do as a fan but not just as a fan and a filmmaker. And so I want to ask Howard just first, because this episode is filled with a lot of difficult things. And quite mm -hmm. often, you're helping us traverse you know, really difficult, stormy waters of steroids and strikes. And I'm the heavy, yeah, that's true. You're the heavy. <laughs> um, what is it about this game? What, what, why do we love it so much? Well, I think it's the lights right here. I feel like I've got to put my glove up to keep the sun out right here. Um, I, I think the thing that we love most about the game, and I saw it mostly, one, when we were talking about this coming in earlier about did we want to sit back here or did we want to sit out, and I wanted to sit in the audience to just follow everyone's reaction to see what they responded to. And I think that gives you a great idea about how people feel about what's on screen. And, and you could see it during the Ripken clips, and it wasn't just because this is the home crowd but also because he looks like us. When you're watching him run down the, the right field line, shaking hands with everybody and high-fiving, he's, I mean, he was a big guy, he's 6'3", 220, but he just looked like a guy with gray hair and a bald spot who was playing baseball. And I think what it, <laughs> and, I, and I think that that connection is something that everyone relates to and I remember the first time I interviewed Greg Maddox, it was like that same thing, just small glasses, he was sitting there in Mesa, sitting on a stool, reading a comic book. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't, you know, he wasn't 6'10", right. he's one of us. Yeah. And, I, and I think that that sort of connection, and I think the other connection, and you can see it with the Mike Barnacle clips, and you can see it throughout all of the commentary, is that I think more, and I don't know if anybody saw the, um, the HBO special with Aaron and, and Mays mm -hmm. uh, a couple years ago. Uh, I think it, 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 someone said it in there. This is a father-son game. This is a mother, daughter, father, son. It's a family game that, that most other sports you can come to on your own. This sport you don't come to on your own because if you come to it on your own, you'll say, it's really boring. <laughs> but if, you, if you're taught the game, you learn the game and then you learn about yourself and you learn about your family and all of that means nothing when you're 10 but it means a lot when you're 40. There's something nice about going to the ballpark and singing the anthem with a lot of people and having that communal thing but baseball really is, as you suggest, a kind of an individual thing or a family unit that goes. You attend a football game and you're all a kind of angry beast uh, <laughs> at the same moment. There's not time Hungry to talk and, and compare that hit or that catch to something you saw uh, 20 years ago when you were a boy or something that you read about or saw in a film uh, that was 40 years ago or 60 years ago. Uh, th there's none of that possibility in football, and not because there aren't breaks, but because you're all in uh, a mood that either something good is happening or something bad is happening. But baseball has a whole range of things, and I, I think that the character of a baseball audience feels a little different. Well, I think what's really funny about that is that when I lived here, I was covering the Redskins for the Washington Post, and I had never uh, covered football as a beat writer before. And I had been in baseball the whole time, and, and generally speaking, I, I, do I have to say I hate football? But you know, let's, <laughs> let's put it this way. Uh, Baseball is a great sport to watch. It's a great sport to follow. It's a fantastic sport to write about. Outside of boxing, it's probably the best sport to write about. I think it's even better than boxing to write about. 
because with football, you essentially have 22 guys smashing into each other at speed you can't, you can't tell. And I'd sit there and talk to Joe Gibbs, and he would say, well, you know, I gotta look at the film. But you know what, I used to think that was like the, the, the great cover to not answer your questions. But it's true. It's true. <laughs> you can't watch a football game in real speed and tell who blew a play on a, a cover three. Whose responsibility was it? And then the football players try to treat it like it's, and the coaches try to treat football like it's the CIA. Well, I really can't kind of get into that until you know <laughs> who's, who blew what coverage there. Anybody Baseball. here from the CIA? <laughs> oh, sorry, we're in DC. Exactly. Well, I, I, I don't have a car here, you can't follow it. I, I wanted to jump in with something, you know, on the one hand, the fans love the game from afar, and we live in a fairly cynical age, and as a reporter covering the game, coming to it as a fan, how did that change your relationship to the game in terms of covering it and, and seeing what goes on behind the scenes, but yet obviously still loving the game, and especially in the last 15 years when so many interesting things have been it's, happening? Well, I think the best thing that happened to me was that I didn't go from fan to journalist. I covered technology first. I was out in the San Jose Mercury News and the Oakland Tribune. And I was a technology writer. My job was to cover telecommunications and networking and phone companies and all of that stuff. If you have a thing for area codes, come see me. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> but when I got, to, I got to cover the A's in 98, I had already been in the business for seven or eight years and having, having covered Larry Ellison and Bill Gates and Eric Benamou and John Chambers and all of these incredibly smart people during this technological wave, I wasn't as intimidated when you walked into a big league clubhouse. And had I gone from having posters of Jim Rice on my wall to walking into the clubhouse, I think it would have been a much different experience. I think it would have been, it would have been very, very difficult. And, I, and you can tell there's that tug between being a fan and then having to do your job. Because once you get into the room, you realize they don't want you there. Right. And they don't want to be your friend. And if you don't learn to get your guard up, they're going to run right all over you. So maybe before we open it up, let's, uh, and you can, there are uh, microphones. microphones at the, uh, in the middle right. of the yeah. house. And uh, please, if you can form orderly lines, or don't be shy, don't please be don't shy, be shy. Please. Um, Somebody has a question. <laughs> Somebody's Anybody here shy. from LA? <laughs> San Diego? <laughs> Minnesota. Um, How about Minnesota? Word for Minnesota. Right. Um, we deal in our film in, in, in many, many chapters uh, about the steroid scandal. Uh, can you just, in the simplest way, sort of for those of us who are still struggling with how to deal with it, um, where are we with it? How, how, do you, how do you, at the end of the day, as you actually say in our film, but, but how do you, where do you put it right now? Well, in terms, of in terms of the effect of the game, I think it's the greatest uh, scandal in the history of, sport, of, of this sport. And I think it's greater than the Black Sox scandal for two very obvious reasons. I think the biggest one is that this scandal touched everybody for every player, every team, every pennant race, every record, not just the home run records, but all of the records. I remember in 2005, right after the hearings, the Red Sox were in a pennant race, and they came in here, and the Orioles just demolished them right before the All-Star break. And the big guy who really destroyed them was Rafael Palmeiro. I think he hit like two home runs, and he had a fantastic series that weekend. And during that week, he had already failed his test. He had already failed the test, it was in the middle of appeal, but he was going to be suspended, and it happened about a month later. They got swept, the Red Sox got swept in that series, and they ended up losing the division to the Yankees by a game. In fact, they might have been tied that year, but because the Red Sox had lost the season series, the, the Red Sox were the wild card and the Yankees won the division. And the Red Sox were incensed, because they were thinking, well, wait a minute, that weekend without Palmero, maybe we win some of those games and maybe we win the division. And that is exactly kind of what, that's the effect of, of, I, of this I, thing on the whole on, on my, the game. My feeling is, is I'd, I'd rank it third after the exclusion of African Americans for eight decades and the denying of the so-called national pastime, this incredible talent that once African Americans were let in with 
you know, a quota system in the National League. They win the MVP in the National League nine out of 11 years. That's one of my favorite baseball statistics. And I would rank uh, the, the gambling. We think of the gambling as just as the White Sox uh, yeah, in 99. Yeah. But it was, for, for at least a couple of decades, a very prevalent thing. And so many of the, uh, today, Ichiro uh, got his 200th hit mm -hmm. and is now has 10 consecutive 200 hit seasons. Uh, passing We Willie Killer uh, for the number of, con of consecutive seasons. And we're not absolutely sure that all of those games are legit no. either. So some of the great treasured names from the early days, the pre Babe Ruth stuff of Napoleon Lajoie, La yeah. of, of well, Honest Hal Wagner. Chase, and everybody knows that. I mean, during that, during that period, I don't think anybody who follows that period would look at it and say, well, that was a clean period, and then the next few years aren't. I'm, I'm not making that suggestion. Yeah. What I'm suggesting is, is that the amount of knowledge that people had at each level was, was, what was going as on. negligent as anything you could think of. This was not a secret. I guess it, it, maybe it comes down to kind of a semantics, but a question of what affected the public's perception of the game, which with the Black Sox scandal seemed to be really drastic that they couldn't believe the game on the field, mm -hmm. and not just that one World Series, but that it called everything into question. Whereas in the steroids scandal, it sort of dribbled out slowly, and there were certain players people suspected, but it didn't have that sort of categorical effect in the public mind. People kept buying the tickets. That's the paradox that you talk about so eloquently. You know, and I think we all struggle with what do we make of this? Because on the one hand, the game was hugely successful. On the other hand, a lot of people no, agreed. were and not I, playing fair. And it's, it's a really complicated and sort of, I don't know, unresolvable dilemma well, in a way. Well, it's true. And I, and I think that the, 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 the distinction that I make, it's, it goes back to the two things that we talk about when, and as a Hall of Fame voter, it's something that I have to think about all the time. And when we were with Kurt Schilling last night, you could tell, I was, I was waiting to ask him, what do you think of your chances, Kurt? Yeah. But um, <laughs> when it's this idea of the better society. Mm. Everyone talks about, well, you know, how can you put an asterisk on the record book? And I do believe there's already an asterisk in the record book when it comes to African Americans, because everyone knows 1947 is the asterisk right. by itself. You know that year is the difference between 46 and today. But I think that, you know, when Kurt said last night that there's always, there, there have always been racists in the Hall of Fame, there have always been alcoholics, there have always been wife beaters, and there have always been cheaters. Well, we like to think of ourselves as getting better as mm -hmm. people. Right. And I don't think that Ty Cobb would be able to act like Ty Cobb in 2010. Right. Let's hope. And I don't think that Gaylord Perry would walk around today bragging that he threw spitballs and cheated. So uh, I don't hold that standard. I say we have a better standard. Right. Fair enough. That's great. Let's start. And what we'll do is we'll just. <laughs> no, no speeches, um, questions. <laughs> we'll try to do them as quickly as possible. Okay, no praise for the clips either. <laughs> I, they were wonderful. But um, no, I, I want to ask you. Um, whether you've noticed that we've gone from a nation that sang the national anthem at ball games to one that listens to other people singing it, you know, performers at the game. It's, and if you have noticed that, when did that happen? Uh, you know, I don't know, and I, I, I've seen that, but, you know, it depends on the ballpark, and I've now, you know, sampled <laughs> many of them, and it's really great when you get a lot of people singing together and liking to sing together. And then you, do, you get the cooler, hipper parks, and you know, you're content to just uh, follow along and make sure nobody catches you looking around uh, <laughs> with the roving camera while they're singing the national anthem. I mean, it's part of you know, what's going on in the country. Over here, should we, just, should we, just, should we alternate? Oh, in yeah. The Hello, um, I'm a huge Buck O'Neill admirer, and I was wondering if you could talk about him and what's a huge scandal to me, why he still isn't in the Hall of Fame even after this special Negro Amen. League panel a few years ago. Amen. Yeah, yeah Amen. we agree with that. With that. Uh, Lynn and I both have to co uh, comment on this. Uh, we love him. He changed our lives in such a profound and unusual way. And we are, he's part of our family and we miss him terribly. We dedicated uh, this film to him. Um, my daughter detoured on her honeymoon to visit him on his deathbed while he had managed my son-in-law to take good care of his granddaughter. 
Um, he was a remarkable human being, and I will remember this time when we had a PBS meeting in Austin, Texas, and he and an old friend of ours in, in public television drove down an hour to Lockhart, which is one of the barbecue capitals of the world, and had barbecue, and as we drove back, there was this brooding storm on the western plain uh, as we were driving north, and it was, looked like it might be a tornado or something it was green, and it, it was bright sunshine where we were, but the wind was picking up, and every once in a while, the rain would splatter the windshield. And Buck started talking about the old days barnstorming. And it was this thing where I could just feel that Bill, my friend who was driving, just eased up on the accelerator. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he's an old baseball guy, too. And, and um, it, it, was, it was just one of the most satisfying afternoons. Buck told about how a day he'd hit for the cycle. Mm. And he'd collected a home run and a, and a double and a single. And then he hit this inside the park home run and pulled up at, at third base, kind of like this. <laughs> so he could collect his, his cycle thing. Um, and he told us great stories all the time. Uh, you know, I'll let Lynn finish this uh, off. I, if I go too much uh, long, yeah. I'll be blubbering. We could spend the whole evening, which we would love to do. Um, why he's not in the Hall of Fame was, I think, the question. And it's really kind of a travesty. Um, more than so many of the people who were in there, who you know may have made the stats, but are not the example of the better people that we could be. He towers over most of the people in there, as far as I'm concerned. It had to do with sort of politics of the committee that was um, charged with going back and revisiting the uh, the last time they were going to revisit the Negro Leaguers who hadn't been yet let in. It was the last time they were going to do what they said, and he was on that committee, and you know it was just a horrible slight to him and to the history that he represented that he wasn't admitted, and there were all kinds of excuses given, but none of them made any sense. And it was just really a devastating thing. The Hall of Fame itself is, does not decide that. It was this committee, and anyway, and we don't want to bore you with that, but I think they have set up a Buck O'Neill Award, which actually will be perhaps much more meaningful. It will be given er only you know, every few years to someone who really does represent the best in all of us, and you know, the person in baseball who has contributed the most. Yeah. So I think he'll be remembered, you know, even more because of that award. So there's a silver lining, and Buck, of course, would have always found the silver lining anyway. But what they could have done is the committee could have come out and said, we're jealous of Buck, so he's not in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Which is really kind of <laughs> that, what happened. That, that, that Ken Burns it. made him famous, <laughs> and therefore, we need to pay him back some way. Um, you know, my favorite Buck O'Neill story was in 1998. I'm covering the A's for the first time, and we go to Kansas City, and I'm walking to the press lounge, and he comes up to me, and he says, Mr. Clean. <laughs> 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 Come sit at my table. <laughs> and so I sat down, and, and I had a, an idea of what was going to become my first book, which was History of Race and the, and the Red Sox. And I was like, this is a perfect time to just start doing some research. And he and I had this fantastic conversation before a, um, an A's, the A's and, the, and the Royals. And I'll never forget what he said. I'm going to put it in the book, and I repeat this all the time, where he says, you know, I don't think about the past so much, except for one thing. Give me the chance and I'll do the rest. And that to me was just everything about what you would want to know about Buck and about how he viewed his time in the future. I had the extraordinary privilege of, of delivering a eulogy at his memorial service in Kansas City after he passed away in 2006. And, you know, our many of our religious traditions suggest that uh, man is made in God's image. And there's very little about human behavior that suggests that that's actually true. <laughs> Buck makes you really realize that it is true. I mean, he lived uh, such a generous life that he reminds you that there could be a larger, higher purpose to your presence here than just eating food and occupying space and buying things. <laughs> and um, he, he was fantastic. We, we could literally spend all and, night. And we urge you all to visit the Negro Leagues Museum in Kansas City, because yeah. that wouldn't have happened without him. And it's an extraordinary place. And his spirit, I mean, you really feel his presence there. So if you ever get the chance, you must go do that. I think we should come over here, right? Yep. Hi. Um, 
In your opinion, who is the greatest baseball player that ever lived? Oh. <laughs> Ken what can take a, that one. <laughs> what a great question. Uh, first of all, before you leave the microphone, can I ask you who you think is the greatest player who ever lived? I'm a Yankees fan, so Mickey Mantle. Mickey okay. Mantle, that's a really good choice. I remember seeing him play. Yeah. Um, you know what? I, I think it's Willie Mays. <laughs> Oh, I have to answer this? Um, I, I'm on the spot. I don't really have, can I pass on this? Yes. For sure, yeah. <laughs> I, I. <laughs> <laughs> you can wait till I go and then okay, you can I'll tell you. Um, it's hard to say when you haven't seen people play and you've just read about them and you've just heard what people said about them. So, and it's also really hard today to think of someone today being as good as the people that you never saw that you can only imagine, or just in little clips of them and stuff. But I have to say, and this is with a big, huge asterisk because of segregation, but Babe Ruth to me, because he was a great pitcher and a great hitter. And as in our film, I think um, Dan Oakrent said it was like having Beethoven and Cezanne in the same person. <laughs> so I can understand that. I, I, you know, I don't know. It's hard not to say Babe Ruth. Yeah, you know what? I'm sorry. I've got a punt on this. Most important baseball player in history? It's a tie between Robinson and Ruth. Right. Yeah. Best all-round player is Willie Mays. Willie Mays. And I, I, it's best player that I saw in my lifetime in terms of the things about the game I respect to Derek Jeter. And the reason <laughs> is because with the exception of Jeter and maybe Ken Griffey Jr., I think Ken Griffey Jr. certainly, they're the only two players that I can think of that I've seen in my lifetime where their defining play could be at the plate, it could be a home run, it could be running the bases, or it could be defense. And that's to me, is what the game is about. Yeah, I agree. All right. I, I actually saw Willie Mays play. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to preface by saying um, I'm a Milwaukee Brewers fan and a Green Bay Packers fan. And one of the big differences between the two teams is the Milwaukee Brewers have absolutely no chance, realistically, of competing with the New York Yankees. And the Green Bay Packers, realistically have a chance of competing with the New York Giants. Um, I was wondering if in your film you touch upon the fact of the disparity in wealth and the competitive imbalance that exists in baseball today. One, wonderful question. And yes, we do, uh, not to the extent that I think your excellent question would require a defined answer. But you know, uh, the, the other uh, sports, particularly the National Football League, have really great revenue sharing. Uh, baseball hasn't yet caught up. The small markets do suffer. Um, but you got to ask the Yankees how scared they are of the Tampa Bay Rays to understand that there's another small market that is right up there. And the Minnesota Twins are the first team to clinch the division um, in, in Major League Baseball, and they're a small market team. So what we know is that while, and, and, and during oh, the, the time Mets. when Steinbrenner threw the money around, the Yankees for 15 years couldn't do anything. They were ham-handled and muscle-bound, and as Lynn's saying, the New York Mets have nearly as much money as the Yankees and can't get to first base with that money. Right. And so, so, Sorry. so what you have is other factors that enter in, like leadership, the ability to spot talent and to develop and nurture and hold on to that talent, the smartness of trades, your willingness to see a long term and not just as we've learned about the Pittsburgh, anybody here from Pittsburgh? Um, yeah. That the Pittsburgh My Pirates proportionally, their, man, their ownership takes proportionally more dollars out per capita than any other franchise. And Pittsburgh has been nowhere since 1992. And you know, the other thing is um, baseball, even though each team sh keeps its own television revenue, there is quite a lot of sharing of um, merchandising and international revenue and the internet. There's actually a lot of money in the game right now. Overall revenue was $6 billion last year. And a lot of that does get divided up. It doesn't all go disproportionately to the richest teams. No. It's just a question of what they choose to do with it. Well, I think that the Green Bay Packers are the reason why there's a salary cap in football because football decided in 1960 that it was important for the Green Bay Packers to be good. And if the Wellington Mayor and if the New Yorks of the world had their way, then football would be in the same position as baseball. But I think that the real problem is that we look at the sport. We look at the sport season by season. 
And therefore, when you have a season by season viewpoint, sure, the Rays are gonna be good, sure, the Twins are gonna be good, but if you look at it cumulatively, essentially what's gonna happen with the Rays is that it's the same thing that happened with the Oakland A's. You're gonna be good for a two to three to five year window. Spasm. Then you're gonna be terrible for 10 years until you begin to, to develop, develop exactly. new talent. And, and I because think you've lost your because biggest stars all your best agents. players are playing for your team or your team. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, this was mentioned quickly in the intro, but you talked about how new stadiums were part of the revolution of you know, baseball in the 90s. And I'm wondering if the film goes into more in depth how new stadium construction stylistically helped bring people back, as well as the great home run chase, and also how important that is for a franchise to have a well, functional ballpark we, we in the really stage. We start off a section about new stadiums by celebrating Camden Yards, which is a, you know. Um, I mean, Anybody was, here from that Baltimore? Was, <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> that was a visionary project at the time, really. I mean, the, the, the way the stadiums had been built was the opposite of Camden Yards. And the ownership there, hiring the right designers and creating a stadium that could hold as many people, but had the elements that made you feel like it was connected to the past. That really set the standard very, very high. And other teams, look, I mean, they see what works. And they realized how incredibly successful that was in addition to putting the stadiums downtown where people could come after work and you could attract corporate clients and all of that. So instead of putting a stadium in a suburban parking lot, uh, putting stadiums back downtown you know, had a, a, a lar large part to do with the success and other te co you know, teams copy each other. But we think it's also interesting to th talk about how the stadiums are financed, which we don't go into in great detail, but you know, that's an interesting development for us to think about in the future as we're gonna be paying off these loans as a Yankee fan not too happy about the New York taxpayers footing such a big chunk of the bill for Yankee Stadium. You know, we, we were at Yankee Stadium the other night when it was, uh, there was a service, kind of an unveiling of the plaque in Monument Valley for uh, George Steinbrenner, and it was, this was the house that Steinbrenner built, and we go, no, this no. is the house that the people we of paid. the- New York built. Yeah. New York built. Right. He, he didn't pay for it, only the Giants can claim uh, that they paid for the, their own stadium. And the Dodgers. And the, and Dodgers. the Dodgers. Yeah. You know, Bud Selig and I are really close. You know that. I know yeah. how close you, you know, and Bud are, close. particularly since he's seen the film. That's right. And uh, I always love when he calls me and uh, his, uh, one of his people says, Howard, I've got the commissioner on the line. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a lot of discussion about how Bud Selig is going to be remembered. Usually conversation started by Bud Selig. Um, <laughs> And he and I sat down one day and I said, you know, Bud, there's no way around this that you are going to be, how you deal with the steroid issue is going to be how you remember. And we've had this discussion. And he would say to me, well, I don't think the people of Boston are going to say that because without a wild card, they're not celebrating right now. And then we also talked about interleague play and we talked about a bunch of things and we have these conversations often. But I'm actually beginning to think that what is, he's really going to be remembered for is this unbelievable era of stadium building. Yep, I agree. If you look at how many stadiums have been built under, under his watch, it isn't, it's, it's remarkable. 18 stadiums in 18. 19 years. Yeah, incredible. And, and he is, without a doubt, regardless of what blame you attribute to him specifically uh, for steroids, the not doing, the inactivity, uh, his tenure is the most consequential. He is the greatest commissioner insofar that so many things, good and bad, have happened that it is just this remarkable uh, you know, thing. I can't, I mean, Kennesaw Mountain Landis came in and got, fired the Black Sox and uh, right. kept the, the game really white. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? Well, I, th I think one thing that's interesting about Sealing, I think you've made this point before, is that he's really been very clear about his job as the CEO of Major League Baseball. And so this whole idea, this sort of mythical commissioner on high with the best interests of baseball as some kind of uh, neutral arbiter of the best interests of the game, which is how Kennesaw Mountain Landis was kind of anointed in the wake of the Black Sox scandal, um, that's really not what Bud Zielik's job is. Yeah, but he doesn't deserve credit for that. I mean, the no, reason, no, yeah, the reason is because 
he doesn't have that power because the yeah. union can go to court now and yeah. they couldn't do it before. Yep, yeah. fair enough. Yep. So uh, I read in the Times uh, in an article that's probably going to be published tomorrow, but it's online now, uh, that they found a copy of the only copy that is known uh, of the quote unquote greatest game ever where uh, Pittsburgh Pirates beat the Yankees in the World Series. Uh, it was found in the wine cellar of Bing Crosby's house. Yes. A film? Uh, you mean film yes, of it? Yes, yeah. Oh, wow. It, yeah, and it's, it's a great story. So my, so my question for you is, in producing these films, uh, uh, whether you have any stories about uh, videos uncovered uh, during the process of your research, and if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, we always have great stories about that. Almost every <laughs> film, you know, something turns up exactly like that. And I heard that story a few weeks ago, that that there had been the coverage of uh, the, the stuff and somebody had gotten all this footage in, and it's in Bing Crosby's, it's just an amazing and it's perfectly preserved uh, footage of, the, of Bill Mazeroski and the whole pirates in 1960 beating the Yankees. Um, For this project, this, we this don't, this project less really so because kind of everything yeah. was basically of that's moving besides the stuff we shot and that's in itself exciting stories. Uh, it came from Major League Baseball uh, because they now control everything that is moving. Everything and, and that I, is moving. They even everything. control, they control the footage we filmed in their stadiums. Everything. Everything it belongs to them. What about, so. what about in the earlier uh, film? Oh, so there's so many examples. I think to me the one that really stands out the most is the home movies that Quincy Troop took of his time in the Negro Leagues which really literally were in the, in the basement and um, his son, the poet Quincy Troop Jr. was um, instrumental in helping us to get uh, access to that and to restore it and to use it. And it really, it was not just the game on the field, but life on the road, the buses, yeah, all of that. Okay. It was incredible. I don't know how we could have told that story without that footage. Uh, just to bring everyone up to date, it's two to one Yankees in the bottom of the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I have a sense there's other scores yeah. coming. No, no. That's it? Uh, the, uh, the, steroids, the steroids report that came out, I think listed... The Mitchell report. Uh, the Mitchell report? Yeah, the Mitchell report, I think, uh, stated 100, 105 players anonymously uh, as being steroid users. Uh, since the report came You're out... You're actually confusing it. The anonymous was an, no. a, a the, the blind testing, testing that had happened before, yeah. the 2003. The Mitchell report came 89. out in 2007 yes. and named names. Well, I guess my point is, they only named a handful of players exactly. names have come out so far. And that handful of players have instantly been branded and deemed to be unfit for the Hall of Fame. That means that there's still 95 more players out there who are unidentified. It, the, the what drug, happens with them? Yeah, the, it, it's, it's conflating a little bit. The, the Mitchell Report actually named more than 100 players. And the most you know, uh, important revelation was, of course, about Roger Clemens. Uh, but the other unnamed players were when the players were doing anonymous testing. And what you have is a leaker out there who's sort of in many. dribs and drabs, many leakers, <laughs> who have found it in their self-interest or in their ego gratification to leak the names uh, of people who tested positive in what was a you know, a promise to be a, an anonymous test. So we have to separate between the legitimate investigation done by the Mitchell Commission into the steroid scandal commissioned by Major League Baseball and their findings, which suggested that it was widespread and people were using on every team and it could not just be those hundred, but in fact hundreds and, and perhaps thousands of people over the term of the thing. Do you see you the other the names bigger, uh, on the list coming out? We, we don't know. Yeah. We, you know it's it's, it's up to the leakers about, to, to, to right. do. You know, what I find interesting about the list is that there is a method to the list, yeah. to the madness of the list. Of, is, of how the names dribble yeah. out. Yeah. Yes, there does seem to be. Anybody who has professed their innocence, who was on the list, got leaked. Mm. Or the at least avenging all those, angels. The, well, there's no, no, some, exactly. All those whose names were leaked profess their innocence. Yeah. There may be others, no. Sammy Sosa came out and said, I defy anybody on the list. He was leaked the next day. Right. David Ortiz said, oh, I've only used rice and beans on the list. He got leaked. Manny Ramirez, no, I never used steroids. He got leaked. 
And so there's also some sort of crusading going on as well with whoever, you know, whatever forces are doing this. And I think with the Mitchell Report, I think the Mitchell Report as, an, as, an, as a body, as a document, the value in it was simply in saying, listen, we're going to admit that we blew this thing because it's not a complete document. The only people who were named in that document are people that the federal government had already connected with either Brian McNamee or Kirk Radomski. Right. Those two, those two or steroid, or Balco, exactly. And those three uh, individual instances do not encapsulate all the people who could have steroids or had access to it. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, so it, even if those 100 names were leaked, it doesn't give you any sense of the scale. And that was also 2003, so by then, players knew there was gonna be testing. So that doesn't really, even if all the names on that list were to come out, it would not by any means be the sense that you could say, okay, now we know everyone who used steroids. Yeah. To me, the ideal World Series would be Cubs over Red Sox in seven. What would each of you like to see for the ideal World Series? Uh, well, you know, I agree with you, except with the outcome. But I, 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 I have been told uh, by very uh, reliable sources that if that were actually to occur, now after 2004 and particularly 2007, the Red Sox don't really, maybe it's the Giants now and the, uh, and, and the, the Cubs, but they can't meet in the World Series. But uh, the old story was that, of course, it would get to the seventh game and the bottom of the ninth and a tie score and the known universe would end. <laughs> <laughs> but what's your favorite oh, World I Series? Have, yeah, I think well, it's this one that's coming up. Yeah, right. Exactly, whatever one is the, is the next one. I, you know, I think that there's, uh, obviously to have the Cubs in the World Series would be very, very interesting. I really don't care about the Cubs because I think the Cubs have completely undermined every bit of credibility they have with their fan base. This is a money game and they're in Chicago. So if they can't win with all the advantages that rich teams have today, they have no one to blame but themselves. Exactly. I believe the Aztecs think the Cubs and the Red Sox are playing next in 2012. <laughs> so, um, actually, so uh, get ready for the laughter. I am a Mets fan, and I'm proud of that. But and this is actually a serious question. It's not how good or bad they are. But I, I noticed in the introduction to, to the 10th inning, you have Andy Chavez's catch which was an amazing catch in the 2006 National League Series in Game 7. It, was, it had every ac acrobatic aspect of it, an amazing thing, could have been great. And then the Mets lost. So, um, and that was probably the last good Mets play since. <laughs> um, so hopefully they'll get better. But, but the, the question is, though, if... If the Mets had gone on to win the World Series, that may have been considered the Mets' greatest play, just like Dave Roberts' right. steal of second base yeah. in, the, uh, in uh, 2004. Yeah. So the question I have for you is, in doing your research and speaking to fans and officials and players, how important are those moments? Those moments that happen that could define a team Right. And then don't. That's a great question. It's well, really I, I agree with one of the, my favorite writers who's uh, Washington Post, David Marinus, when he did a talk, uh, I think it was for his book um, for, for Rome 1960, where he said that history writes people out. It's our job to write them back in. And I think, that, I think winning or not winning writes you out. One of the things that people forget and I'm sure you're happy to forget this, is that before game four of the 2004 ALCS, Alex Rodriguez had torn the Red Sox apart. And there had been this conversation that he was not a clutch player and that he was not very good in the playoffs and the whole thing. And now mm -hmm. nobody else in the Yankees hit. But if they go out and win that next game, yep. whether Dave Roberts steals the base or not, his entire narrative changes. Now, obviously, he had the great playoff last year. So it, people know he can play in the postseason. But it's a huge thing because the end result is often what defines the entire journey. And I think, it, for me at least, I try to make sure that people remember how fun the journey is regardless of the outcome. And, and I think that the, one of the great parts of baseball is that it is as much about loss as it is about winning, that we talk about the teams 
that the, the loyalty of the fans and the identification with the thing, and that I would submit that we are going to remember Armando Galarraga's not perfect game much longer than Dallas Breeden and Roy Holiday's perfect games that were, happened within a month's span. And it had to do with that, that element of loss. Oh. I mean, he's, but, but we have him, you know, in there. So I think they do transcend those yeah. moments. And I think the actual, the best example of the end result not defining it was 2001. Yes. Because 2001, most people don't even care who won that World Series. It was just 9-11 and the unbelievable postseason and just the, it was the game itself. And it was the one season that I, that I covered where the game was more important than the final score. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one more question. Ugh. One more question. We failed That's cruel, you. all you people let me, waiting. Let me, let me just thank all of you for putting this together. Hopefully in 16 years, I'll be back for the 11th inning. <laughs> and we'll start with Armando Galarraga, yeah. yeah. Um, a, a question, exactly. A question about the grandiosa segment. It seems as though the way that Latino ballplayers are portrayed is predominantly either too goofy to be taken seriously, like Manny or Isaac Jen, or big, fun-loving teddy bears like David Ortiz or, or Sammy Sosa, and you never hear about how great Ozzy is as a manager, or how good Peter was as a pitcher, or this, that, the other, and I'm wondering why that is. Oh. I'm sorry, could you say you saying, that? Are you saying that you think Oh, yeah, why it seems that Latino ballplayers, you never hear about how good they are at baseball, their skills, it's, they're kind of characterized as being silly, or gregarious, and fun-loving, and, and why I, I, that I is. Mean, let me see if I, there's a little bit of an echo, so it's hard to uh, hear yeah, you. I'm I just going to paraphrase the question, which I think is, you know, are Latin players essentially stereotyped as kind of like fun-loving guys yes. and someone you don't take seriously, basically, and that they're not given the credit for like being a general manager, a manager, yep. or you know, a smart pitcher, stuff like that. I don't, I don't know. No, hundred percent. I mean, I, I always refer to it as the happy Latin, and the, that's the the baseball has been very, very good to me thing, where you have the players in the clubhouse recognizing that if language is going to be an issue. And, if, and, 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 and it's a huge issue because very few of us speak Spanish. So, you know, you've got a press that is supposed to cover a game that's 40% Latin and maybe four or five reporters speak Spanish. So what are we actually, what are we conveying to the public about who these people are? We don't know who they are. I speak Spanish, but very, very few beat writers do. And I went down to learn it for that very reason. But if you go talk to Ozzy Guillen, and get him behind closed doors, he'll talk a year off about this, about respect, about being treated with respect. And you talk to David Ortiz about it, and it's the same thing. The, the guy who will make you cry about this is Louis Tion, because people who remember Louis Tion in Boston, they remember him with so much fondness, but part of that fondness was this happy Latin stereotype. It's great to be and with to, a wiener. Exactly, and today he says, that cost me. It cost me a career. I never got to use my brain. They never let me use my brain. And that says a lot to me. Great question. I think that, that's our final question. Thank you all. We yeah. really enjoyed yeah. this evening. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Howard Bryan. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Very good. Fantastic. Thank you.